Hello and welcome. India has many problems to reckon with, including in the area of infrastructure and economic growth in, as a general proposition. One of the problems is financing of uh, some of the needs that India has, and particularly at the scale that India is looking to finance them, $1 trillion just for infrastructure in coming years. To understand how the markets could be deepened and widened to serve the larger interests of economic growth, well, I'm joined by a former uh, Reserve Bank Deputy Governor, Subir Gokarn, who's going to talk about uh, the subject of widening financial markets and deepening financial markets. So, Subir, what are your uh, uh, top-level thoughts here? Well, I think there are uh, a number of uh, challenges that uh, emerging economies face. Uh, obviously, every country faced these challenges as they grew, and they dealt with them in different ways. But when we look at uh, the compulsion of infrastructure, the fact that you know this may be our biggest constraint to sustaining growth, uh, and not, not just growth at a macro level, but also in terms of spreading it uh, evenly regionally, I think the, the compulsion is that much greater, the need for speed is that much more. So it has to be very quick and very coordinated, concerted. Uh, so I think one of the key uh, requirements there is to have the ability within the market uh, to absorb large quantities of very long-term debt, for example, which is the primary means of financing infrastructure. If the government were to do it, all the government needs to do is to issue its own paper and uh, intermediate those funds into capital investment and of course that's going to going to happen of the one trillion dollar target that you mentioned it's an aspiration actually uh, about 30 percent or so is expected to come from government and that's something that needs to be taken into account but the remaining 70 percent is a very high burden on the private sector and the capacity to finance that kind of requirement uh, in terms of the existing state of the domestic debt markets I think is is really not there so very quick development of the domestic uh, debt market, uh, both on the, or particularly on the demand side. Now, the biggest consumers of, of corporate debt, uh, long-term corporate debt in particular, are insurance and pension funds. These are the, uh, the channels, the saving channels, which actually have commitments over very long term, so they need to be able to invest in long-term, similarly long-term assets. So creating that space, uh, encouraging the growth of insurance products, pension products, is, I think, a very important uh, requirement. In fact, I would say it's, it's, it's perhaps the most important requirement from the point of creating domestic capacity right. to invest in this, these kinds of instruments. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, clearly, but there has to be some sort of a vision, some sort of a target for this. It's happening fairly slowly already, but uh, perhaps it needs to be accelerated. On the other side, uh, you know, markets function when there are lots of players who, who trade, otherwise they're not uh, markets. And uh, although you know, institutions like uh, the U.S. Uh, secondary market institutions, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, have been in the news recently uh, for, for not so good reasons. Uh, I don't think we should underestimate the role of this sort of backstop secondary market function uh, in the development of markets. And when we look at the historical evolution of the U.S. debt markets, which I think are really kind of a model for, uh, for other countries, uh, the role that these institutions played, they were government-sponsored, uh, but they played a very important role in providing assurance and stability to the markets that there's always somebody willing to buy. And uh, so that, I think, allowed for markets to, to grow, even though there may have been some imbalances between the demand and the supply. And I think we have to start thinking whatever lessons can be learned from more recent experience, of course, has to be taken into account. But we have to start thinking in terms of, uh, of secondary market. And the third element uh, is very specifically about risk. Uh, we have an experiment, a very important one, I think, uh, uh, in terms of credit enhancement, which is uh, a, a pilot that the IIFCL is, is running, uh, where uh, securities issued by infrastructure projects will be provided some enhancement for a fee. This makes them more attractive to a larger group of investors. And I think that's one way to speed up. Uh, the development of markets, the appetite for these securities. So everything needs to be brought to bear on this. And I think, you, you know, what, there's no one way or one sort of magic uh, bullet. But all of these things working together, I think, is really where the strategy needs to... You know, so some of the pronouncements, actually not uh, new pronouncements of the union budget, you know, uh, creating uh, or giving incentives to people to invest in equity funds. Uh, more steps to help people open bank accounts, you know, the whole financial right. inclusion effort. How is all of this adding up to the larger, if it's a problem, that, you know, uh, our savings rate is still falling or has fallen right. quite substantially. Uh, 
uh, and and are, are we doing enough to address that problem and then back to our original problem? I think we have to make some distinction between the larger challenge of financial inclusion uh, and the more uh, focused issue or the narrower issue of infrastructure. Uh, they, they both uh, obviously have a goal. I mean, the goal eventually is to ensure that whether it's financial inclusion in the broader sense or infrastructure investment, that this is a means to an end. It is a way to translate financial activity into the, the objective of growth, balanced regional growth, more equitable growth, and so on, more, more access to, to credit so that livelihoods are, are uh, improved, livelihood opportunities are improved. So that's the larger uh, vision and I think uh, uh, objective uh, of financial inclusion. But this does not necessarily translate in and of itself into uh, funding for infrastructure because banks, for example, are not really the, uh, the, the best way to lend to infrastructure. They are essentially short-term borrowers and lenders. And we've, we've be, we are in a situation where banks are lending, have lent actually heavily to infrastructure, but that's really not the right use of, or not the optimal use of bank funds. So I think we need to create specialized channels uh, through which long-term funding is, is uh, provided. And it, through that, you've got to uh, create again channels into the saving population whether domestic or, or foreign, uh, who are interested, who inherently have an appetite for, uh, for long-term instruments. So that channel has to be created separately. There has to be separate focus on that. And of course, that can happen and is not in conflict with the larger issue of widening access to formal financial markets. I think it's very important to recognize that inclusion uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're addressing people who have no sure. access to yeah, finance yeah. at all. Yeah. What you're trying to do is to bring them from a sort of informal, unregulated uh, sector to one that is more formal, regulated. And you hope that th this will improve uh, their both their access and the cost at which they uh, they have this access. Right. So, uh, last question. So, you know, uh, as we do all of this, and we're obviously there's a heightened concern about what financial markets broadly can do to solve this problem of whether it's infrastructure deficit or over financial, overall financial deficit. What are the concerns? What should we be careful about? I think the, the, uh, it's, it's very easy to get a little carried away with you know, the, the objective, financial development, uh, you know, very attractive, uh, people are looking at it. Uh, it's, it's very visible. There are immediate sort of, uh, uh, sort of metrics that you can use to measure them. And uh, you sometimes tend to underestimate the risk involved with each of these new developments. So keeping a very sort of keen eye on risk, particularly there are many products which we obviously have seen uh, over the course of the, the way the crisis unfolded, where uh, risk is difficult to measure and therefore is often underestimated. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that we need to even get to that point. But even at a, at a somewhat lower level, uh, understanding risk, understanding how uh, much risk there is in, in any particular product given its exposures, and how best, how most efficiently to mitigate that risk, I think is very important. Because otherwise you're gonna have a lot of resources going into projects that end up failing, which then undermines the whole credibility of the program. I think that's, uh, you know, that's not a risk, or that's not a, a burden that you want uh, to bear uh, as because of the priority, because of the compulsion to act. Right. So, generally, I mean, how is how is the uh, the uh, the economic uh, environment looking to you in the context of the general sense of uh, uh, positiveness that the government and everyone seems to have? It's been, uh, I think, a, a, a sort of uh, trial and error kind of process where uh, there has been some advancement in the way that infrastructure has been financed but also there have been lots of uh, dead ends, brick walls that, uh, that have been hit. And all of these hopefully should provide some lessons uh, in terms of how to do things and how not to do things. I think there are challenges both in, at the macro level, which is what is the right uh, facilitating environment for a public-private partnership, which is you know, what is the government supposed to do and how, does it, how credibly does it deliver. And in that context, then what is the private sector supposed to do and whether it can do it without uh, crutches, without without being, you know, an, uh, forced to sort of depend on bailouts or, or re rewriting the rules of the of the game. So this viability on the private sector's part and uh, delivery on the public sector's part, I think that's the combination that we've really been struggling to find and have found it 
in some sectors and perhaps in some projects, but it's not been clearly a universal success. Financing is an important part of that because if you are constantly facing the risk of uh, project uh, unviability, uh, you're going to have that much more difficulty persuading people to provide finance through whatever channel, whether it's, it's debt or equity. And that uh, really creates enormous constraints on uh, the ability to continue these projects. So I think we, you know, it all f hangs together and ultimately finance is, I think, uh, a superstructure. It's something that rides on the back of the real underlying economic viability of uh, a project. And that in turn is affected by both the way the project is, is conceptualized, designed, and, and executed, and the policy and regulatory environment within which it operates. So both of these are the foundation on which effective financing can be done. Thank you very much for speaking Thank with you. us.